Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Wyoming rock climber and author Sam Leitner Jr. has penned his newest book, Wyoming, A History of the American West. It's one of the most definitive books ever written on the history of Wyoming, and his book tells a story of our state from the geology that created it through the present day. Leitner's work is expansive and is written in a timeline that runs in tandem with the significant events of the greater world. We'll meet the author next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. And we are pleased to be joined on this Wyoming Chronicle with Wyoming author Sam Leitner, Jr. Sam, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Craig. Sam, your book about Wyoming's history is just wonderful. Um, and I want to get to that in just a, just a moment, but I want to learn a little bit about you first. Um, you're a, pretty much a lifelong Wyoming resident. Is, is that accurate? I'm a, I consider myself a resident lifelong. There were times when I was abroad, uh, but I, I grew up in, in a place that used to be called Jackson. Um, that place is kind of not there anymore. <laughs> It's a different place now, but uh, I grew up in Jackson, and at an early age, uh, I got into climbing with a friend who lives in Jackson still, Mark Newcomb, and uh, his dad taught us how to climb, and climbing ended up really taking over my life. So, you know, we climbed in the Tetons, but then when I got older, uh, I made sure I was at the University of Vitavu, otherwise known as the University of Wyoming. <laughs> And then I've, I've lived in a couple other places. I lived in Banff for a while. I lived in Southern Thailand for a while. I, I even did a stint in Moab, Utah, all around climbing. And uh, uh, so I, can, I can't say that consistently I have been in Wyoming for that entire time, but Wyoming has always been my home. My family's still here, so. And one of the great beauties of your book, in my eyes, is, is not only Jackson do you talk about in its infancy, you talk about Wyoming in its infancy, and I'm talking geologically. And I think maybe that's, that's where I'd like to start with, with the book, The Wyoming, A History of the American West. Why the book, Sam? Why did you decide to write this book? Uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I love history. I, 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 I read nothing but history, pretty much. If I'm reading a novel, it's either because someone I know wrote it or because uh, it's related to some historical event that um, I, want, I want to know more about. And uh, I've, I've just always been fascinated with our history. Um, I, I got the idea from a friend in, in Montana who was telling me, you know, there was this book written about all 53 or 56, I think it's called 56 is the name of the book. It's about different counties there. And I thought, huh, I could do a 23 for Wyoming. And as I started to work on it, I was, I was like, no, no, what we've got to do is actually make a, a fun read out of Wyoming's history because it's not just Wyoming's history. You go looking into Wyoming's history, you're learning the Western United States history because things either took place in Wyoming and had an effect on the states all around us or those things on those other states had an effect on Wyoming. So I don't know. I just I can't hope. I can't overstate what I perceive this book will become, Sam, and that's going to be one of the definitive works truly about Wyoming's history. Um, not only, as we said earlier, from the early formations of it geologically, but every other great story that some of us may have heard a little something about and already forgot, you cover in, in your book. And... Um, I'm curious, what, how do you think this book will be used? It's such a great work. I, I would like this to be, you know, there's a couple other history books on Wyoming and they're, they're valuable and they're very important for historians because they're very detailed. 
I would like this to be the general history book that that people go to and go, okay, I know about, I know who Cattle Kate was because I read this. I I I I know why John Coulter was in Wyoming. Uh, I I I know what the Teapot Dome scandal is now. Um, all of these things that that make up our history. Um, I tried to pick not only the most entertaining stories, but also the ones that had the biggest influence on the rest of the country or that had an influence on the world. You know, Wyoming horses in World War I, um, little things like that, that they could all be their own book. But to me, they felt like they were important enough for, for a Wyoming citizen to, to be able to say, well, I know about that. Uh, and this is why Wyoming is important in the world. How would you classify your writing style? How is it that you perceive that you tell the story? I, you know, the hardest, the hardest line to write in any book is the very first one because you think you got to get it all correct. And I rewrite everything. But what I start out as is, is writing in my external voice. I write the exact same way that I would tell you the story. And then I have to come back and correct all the grammar and, and, or at least attempt to correct all the grammar. I usually have people helping me out with that. But I have to, I have to write the way I speak. And so I, I think it, that comes across as being a storyteller. Um, and, and most of us can, do, can, can tell stories very well. Um, you just have to get comfortable with the idea you're going to write it down. And then you go back and you fix it. When did you start work on this book? And I ask it in the context really of Jackson, when you go back and you recount an interview you had with, with Cliff Hansen um, back in the days prior to the formation and talking about the history of how Grand Teton National Park came to be. But goodness, that was a long time ago, and yet it's included in the book. How, how long have you been working on this thing? I did a, I did a book called, uh, mm. uh, it's a roadside history of Jackson. And that was, I think, in I was getting to interview all these older folks that, that you know, I'd, I'd, I'd always looked up to them and known they'd had this place in history, but, you know, I learned a whole different thing about them. But I started my research then, but I could also say that, you know, I started research on this with Mr. Parrott's history class back in the, in the eighth grade when we had six weeks of, of Wyoming history too. So, you know, if you're into history and you are from Wyoming, you're going to know about a lot of these things and you're going to know not details, but you're going to know the basics of looking into the immigrant trail, looking into Red Cloud's war or so forth. You're going to know that those things are there. You discuss the interaction of the Native Americans and the white tribe, as you, as you describe them, as well as anyone that I've ever read. That's such an interesting part of Wyoming's history that I think people understand a very little, a little about today. Would you agree? I, I do think that, that it's, it's not that well understood. I think, I think we tend to trend towards black and white and not see all the gray that comes into history. Um, um, you know, and, and then Hollywood hasn't done us any favors uh, with you know, the John Wayne approach, which I love John Wayne, but that's not necessarily how history took place. Um, and the, the interesting thing about our history with uh, the indigenous tribes, the, the, the white tribe history moving in with these other tribes is also the time frame in United States history. The Civil War had an enormous amount to do with how that took place and disease had a huge amount to do with how that took place. Uh, it's, it's, there's, it's a very complicated history. It's not real simple of, all right, we're just coming in and we're taking your land. It was, it was a lot more going on. And you described all of those things that you talked about just in such good detail and, and, and very well. You, um, I've got to ask, there are so many, you cover every character that I could think of, you know, from mountain men to the, to the railroad and, and well beyond it. Um, and, those of us who live in Fremont are used to live. I used to live in Fremont County. You still do. You know, we know maybe a little bit more about the mountain men part of our history and fur trading and, and that era. But do you have a favorite character um, of all of those that you talked about in that era that really that you appreciate? And I think I know the answer to this question. Is Bridger. 
Yeah. With Bridger. <laughs> and I, I, and I, I said somewhere in the book as an aside, I went out of the narrative and said in the, in the author's eye, if, you know, in the naming of Wyoming, if Wyoming was going to get the proper name for what's taken place in its history, we would either be the state of Bridger or the state of Washakie. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit more about that because that's certainly on my list of things to ask you about those. I mean, those of us who are very, vaguely familiar with how Wyoming was named, it was an Ohio congressman who happened to be born in the Wyoming Valley in Pennsylvania and thought that would be a cool name and and uh, later on had second thoughts about that as I've come to learn. But um, you make a great case on why those two individuals were really worthy, perhaps, of having this state named after them. Let's talk about Jim Bridger first and the qualities you perceived in him. He, well, he came out, you know, as a kid. He was probably 18, maybe 17 when he, when he came west. Uh, uh, I believe it was with Ashley's uh, group or, uh, he, you know, the Hugh Glass incident and all that sort of stuff. That all took place when he was a kid. But he stayed west. And when... Other trappers were moving on, you know, when the trapping era ended and they moved on to Oregon or they, they moved back east. Uh, he stayed here and, and, and went into the next era, which was the immigrant era. Uh, and he married into the indigenous people. And he really became for a very long time, you know, 50 years of his life, uh, integral in those 50 years for Wyoming. He was guiding people across the immigrant trail. He was uh, assisting the Shoshone in getting weapons to defend themselves. Uh, he, you know, he, and, and also giving them ideas on, well, this is, this is how the uh, great father might react to that and so forth. So he was a part of things all the way through his life until, until he actually had to leave the state and be, be cared for back east. Um, he was just a, a fundamental part of it in that era. And you talk about his character. He, he, stood, he, he, stood, he stood for what he believed in. He didn't back down. Uh, he, he tried to be a good man at all times. And obviously we can point to the, that first big event that uh, uh, the Hugh Glass incident and, 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 and uh, he and another trapper uh, uh, abandoning Hugh Glass because they think he's going to die. And they think they're about to get attacked by... I believe it was the uh, Arikara. Uh, uh, well, he felt horrible about it, but he was a kid at the time and was kind of taking orders from somebody else. And even Hugh Glass later met him and said, no, oh, you were just a kid. It, you didn't know. So he was an honorable man, I believe. As was Chief Washakie. And Chief Washakie for sure was. Chief Washakie was known, uh, you know, he's a badass. Uh, he, he, uh, he was a tough guy who was known to be the one you didn't want to engage with. The other tribes knew you didn't want to wind up fighting him when things went to hand to hand combat in the fights between the Crow and the, and the Shoshone or the Lakota and the Shoshone. You didn't want to mess with him. And he, he understood basic, uh, you know, basic tactics too. However, he was real quick to go to the peace pipe and, uh, in, in Wyoming's case, he was uh, a, a very wise man in going, you know what, we're sort of caught between a number of tribes here, and this white tribe's the new one. I think our best bet is to side with them, because otherwise we're already being picked on by the Lakota. We've already got a war going on with the Crow right now. Let's side with these guys. And he worked very hard to have a peaceful way through things when it was very, a very disruptive time for his people, and the obvious choice for a warrior was to go to war. He chose, he chose no, we're not going to do that. That's not going to be our way. Sam, in your book, you don't shy away from tough, tragic events. What happened at Crowhart Butte was on that list. Yeah. Uh, it, it's an interesting thing that the two, the two chiefs did decide to you know, Big Robber and, and Washkie said, this is not, you know, after three or four days of, of fighting, uh, they said, this is just killing our young men. Let's two old guys go out and settle this. And it's, I think, I, I, you know, there's, there's no written of this, but when you look into how things took place, apparently Big Robber was mocking Washkie during that fighting 
where the young men were dying, was saying, why don't you get out and fight yourself? And Washke was sort of directing things. And so then when, the, when this happens, um, Washake knows he's a very good hand-to-hand -hand guy. And Big Robert gets called out, says, why don't you, Washake says, why don't you fight me and we'll just decide it on our own. And now Big Robert's been mocking him for days. I don't, I, I haven't seen where someone said, yeah, he didn't want to do it, but I would not be surprised if Big Robert was saying, oh, I shouldn't have been saying all these bad things all this time. <laughs> well, and that certainly then influenced the history then of the Crow and the Shoshone, and I guess you could say ultimately the Arapaho tribes, which you talk about as well, I'm, I'm very candidly. And, and, and um, I don't know where to stop talking with you here, Savvy. There's so much in, in this book. Again, it's just starts with the formation of the state through present day, nearly, and, and everything in between. Sam, you talk about writing that first sentence of a book and the difficulty in doing that sometimes. The cover, in my eyes, also must be right up there with, with the difficult choices on how you're presenting the book to someone who's going to see it for the first time. What went into the development of this, this cover of this book? You choose a, a buffalo, you choose the train. What went into it? Uh, my friend Brendan Weaver, who works here for, for Maven Outdoors, um, uh, he's an a artist and a, I guess graphic designer type guy. And when he found out I was working on this, Brendan's originally from Newcastle and uh, he's lived, you know, multiple places in the state. He played for the, for the Cowboys, played football for the Cowboys. Um, he's a Wyoming boy if there ever was one. And he just said, I'd really like to be able to get a shot at, at, at designing the cover. Now I hadn't even thought about who was going to do the cover at that point. So I was like, great. Yeah, sure. Sure. Do it. And, uh, he played with me for a while while I did it too. He was going to read the whole book and he kept telling me, nah, I haven't gotten around to it. No, nah, I, I don't know. And then all of a sudden he's like, no, I read the thing like a month and a half ago. Here's what I've got. And he breaks out the stuff nice. that he's got. And I was like, wow, you've hit it out of the park. I mean, you've, you've got the traditional colors. You've got the two things that are, uh, you know, um, major components of our history. It's got a Wyoming, you know, I was like, what font is he going to choose? to put the word Wyoming on there, he, he used a license plate. It was brilliant. And uh, I, don't, I don't think, you know, you could, you could have gone with Random House's best printer and, and they, they wouldn't have come up with a better cover. I need to give credit where credit's due. I actually saw Brendan's post on Facebook about your book, and that was my first um, notice of what you had done. So, so thanks to Brendan from my end as well. I want to talk to you a little bit about what you're doing today, you, you're a climber and you're a writer, or you're a writer and you're a climber. How do, where does that work? Uh, the, our, I'm, a writer, so I'm a writer after I'm a climber because that's how the order of things came. I, I never went into being a writer because I had this strong internal thing that said, I wanna be a writer. I got into being a writer because I was a climber and I, was in, I had this great adventure, this great climbing adventure, and I said, I gotta write this down. This was too cool. And it wound up becoming an article in a magazine. And all of a sudden I realized, okay, it appears you've got a talent for doing that. So that can be the other thing you do besides climb. But I was definitely a climber first. And uh, uh, my life has, has revolved around climbing and I would not be a writer if I hadn't been a climber. You have several first ascents to your name. You also have spent a great deal of time in the Lander area recently, making sure old routes are now safe again today. What, what is it that you're hoping to do? Well, so the, the most common form of climbing, the most popular form, really what's brought rock climbing out to be a, 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 a international sport that's commonly done around the world is what we call sport climbing. And that involves fixed anchors that are in certain spots in the cliff uh, that are your safety equipment. And the first ones we put in 30 years ago have worn out. They weren't out of the best materials. It was far more of a crazy sport back then. There weren't, there weren't uh, standards. The standards have come way up in the last 20 years as far as quality. And the equipment has gotten smaller and less unsightly. So my goal has been to 
replace the old wearing out stuff, but replace it with that which doesn't bother the non-climbing public. Your book previous to Wyoming, A History of the American West, was Heavy Green. You spent some time in Thailand. Um, you present this, this fascinating um, book on a portion of Vietnam's history from both sides. How did, did your time in, in overseas influence how you wrote that book? I, I have met people from both sides. Uh, I've, I've got a close friend that lives over in Asia who is a Vietnam vet uh, on the American side. And uh, I've had Vietnam War vet friends uh, who were uh, from Laos and from Vietnam. So I've, I've heard both, both aspects. And um, that, that was part of the reason why I wanted to do that book. Do you climb and write in the same day? Do you have days set aside for writing, days set aside for climbing, or you kind of wake up and go with the flow? It's, it's usually one or the other. I have a hard time with the writing without warming up my mind. I can't have a lot of outside uh, audio sources going on and, and I can't have a plan to do something else that day. So um, I've, I've got to just sort of focus on it in the morning and get my mind around it and then I can stay focused on it. And the climbing, that usually requires some driving and warming up the body and so forth. So that takes all day too. So it's one or the other. You've written, I think, nine books. Am I right about that? Is that the correct number today with, with the newest here? I think that's the number that are published. I have two that I didn't publish. Um, one was, was just, a, a, well, both of them were, were, they didn't quite have a market. And so, uh, but they, they were fun to write. You know, really, I've thought about your book as a possible use, maybe as a travelogue. I mean, you talk about so many people in the book, and someone goes by Walcott Junction. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the Bridger Valley, for crying out loud, I mean, the, the references are all over Wyoming Ames Monument. I mean, you could just go on and on. And your book provides context for all of that. So really, you've done the heavy lifting in my eyes, almost. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the research has been done on, on doing sort of an audio version of a roadside history. Um, you know, I've got, I've, got, I've got the knowledge somewhat in my head and, 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 and definitely have the notes for most of it. But um, putting it in that different format and laying it out in a linear highway version, um, that'll take some work, but I think it'd be a fun project. How about your next climbing challenges? Do you have any anything on your mind there? Well, things are things are up in the air right now. Uh, we were a number of us were going to go over and climb Mount Kenya this summer. Uh, that was going to be the big trip, but um, it's not looking like a lot of international travel taking place anytime soon. So probably Wind Rivers, and there's okay. not much better of a place to go than the Wind Rivers. So now I think about the the book that you've written um and you and pretty much in present day you talk about how even this year recently Wyoming's fiscal woes were starting to present themselves and I and I don't at all mean to to bring forward that this is a political book because it isn't um in my in my eyes but now we have this next chapter and have you thought about you know, in the context of, you know, we're interviewing using social distancing. Our cameraman's far away from you. He has a mask on. You and I aren't even in the same town. And Wyoming is now going to change. From someone who has such a great perspective on Wyoming's history, I'm curious, Sam, what do, what do you see? What do you see in Wyoming's future here? I don't know that I see that much great. I mean, you have to look at it in the context of a long-term history. So let's turn the time back to the last time something similar to this happened. That'd be 1919, Spanish flu. Wyoming suffered roughly like the rest of the country and the rest of the world did. And that was minor compared to if you go back to the immigrant trail and the number of people who died of cholera. And at one point on the, along the immigrant trail, one of the Northern Cheyenne tribe might have lost 50% of its people to cholera, not recognizing that they were downstream from the trail. And then you go back to um, to the 
big epidemics of, of flu and smallpox that it's possible wiped out 50% of the uh, population of North America. And I, I guess what I'm saying is we're going through what is a crazy time for you and I, Craig, because um, we've lived with vaccines and antibiotics and treatments. And all of a sudden that's not working on this particular thing. But you go back through human time, this isn't that different. This, isn't, this is something that happened pretty regularly. And so I think we're going to change just as the rest of the world does. And we're gonna probably shake hands with our elbows and do that kind of stuff. But I bet we're gonna go back to a Wyoming that was uh, quite similar to what we had six months ago. Well, I think many of us hope that that's the case, quite frankly, um, that things don't change. We all are here for a reason. Um, and s some wonder whether other people around the country are starting to recognize that, perhaps. Well, the book is right over your left shoulder. It's Wyoming. It's a history of the American West. And Sam, I, I can't encourage viewers um, enough that um, this is a wonderful consolidated place where they can just fall back into Wyoming's history almost as if they were walking with Jim Bridger or even before. So thank you so much for writing this. Best wishes on your future endeavors. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me here. Thanks for the kind comments. Thank you for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.